And greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast alongside Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre and all of you. I am Steve Dace. It is uh, great to be back home, but I always love any excuse whatsoever to visit Tennessee, which might be my new relocation mistress. I love that state. It's like it's got central time zone. It's just cold enough, you know, and, and at Christmas that you can still feel like it's the holidays. Um, but there's not much winter. Beautiful country. Great people. Uh, appreciate Tennessee stands uh, for inviting me to come down there and uh, keynote their fundraiser on Saturday night. Guys, we had almost as many people there Saturday night as voted in the Iowa caucus. It was a very <laughs> impressive turnout. <laughs> Totes believe. <laughs> and I, I decided, as you know me, I I've, I've don't have a lot pre-prepped, you know, when I'm getting ready to do one of these things. But walking up to the stage, I thought, I'm going to use this as my eye break, uh, my icebreaker, you know, opening line. OK. And then I realized, I don't know how many people in Tennessee will even understand what that's a reference to. But hey, the room laughed. They, they, got, they got it. So that's what's good. You know, but uh, uh, great group of folks. Always uh, love the opportunity. Uh, to interact with folks. And I, I told several of you that were there, I met some folks that drove hours to come. Our great friend, the artist formerly known as Rachel Semmel, now known as Rachel Cawley, who is very much in tow uh, with baby, getting uh, ready to deliver her first child. I met her and uh, her uh, new husband as well. They came nice. to the event. I, d- so I didn't that even was know she was cool. expecting. Yeah. yeah huh. she, and uh, she's very expecting. You know, so uh, that was great. They came and had a chance to hang out and talk with them for a while. And and I told everybody, I love doing these. I didn't do them a lot when the kids were growing up because I want to be at home more. But now that the kids are older, they don't care about being around me as much, you know. And, uh, you know, we entertain ourselves here, you know, I mean, but the reason I love doing the speaking stuff is because it's a chance just to in the moment directly connect with an audience to find out, am I making a connection? Am I addressing things that they care about? Otherwise it's just the three of us in here connecting with one another and just talking to ourselves and we entertain each other. And then hopefully you're entertained along the way, but there's no certainty of that. Like there is when there's a chance to interact directly with people on that level. The last here in town, but when, it, you know, the Blaze and Tucker Carlson and we were all down there for the presidential uh, thing that the family leader uh, held, uh, uh, you were obviously busy and on point, you know, media wise all day long. And Aaron was behind the scenes. So I was the one meeting a lot of people. You are our ambassador to the people. The level of gratitude that they have just authentic. It's it's profound. It, it does. It reminds you that we're not just three dudes in a I room. It, the voice it does. gets out there. It, it recharges your battery, yeah. man. It does. I think you can even sense I've got a little extra, you know, juice. You know, I got a little, uh, uh, you know, the, the love tank got refilled, and that's important. By the way, I should mention, speaking of direct connection, after today's show, if you are a Blaze TV subscriber, uh, I am doing uh, the, our next off the record live chat. We do these, all the Blaze hosts, uh, we do uh, several of these and rotate these throughout the year. Uh, I'm doing my first one of 2024 today at 1.30 Central on Blaze TV. Since it's uh, over on Blaze TV, no question is off limits. You don't have to worry about big tech censorship. All right. And if you're not yet a Blaze TV subscriber, head over to blazetv.com uh, slash off the record all one word blaze tv.com slash off the record use the promo code off the record when you sign up for a discount and then you can make sure that you are not yet a blaze tv subscriber become one that way and you can join us today for our off the record chat from 1 30 to 2 o'clock uh central time if you want to get access to that chat because they do post them right aaron after the fact indeed yeah so even if you're like oh i i, I would subscribe but I, I just can't because i can't get there during that period of time well you can get the transcript of that chat uh, after the fact by being a Blaze TV subscriber as well. BlazeTV.com slash off the record. Use off the record as the promo code to join in. All right. So uh, we look forward to that. All right. Coming up on uh, on, on today's show, uh, next hour. Next hour, we're going to have a very important conversation I want to highlight for you now. Um, our good friend, Tracy Bean. So I got rave reviews about her, by the way. Uh, with uh, her first appearance on the Dace Group on Friday. And a few people who said, next time, though, bring her back when the topics are better. <laughs> right? They're never better. They're so. never better, guys. 
I mean, looking at her reaction to the the to to uh, bleep Lord Nefarious says, was she prepped on what's coming? Did she know what we were we're starting with? Did she know what what that is? Every because it was she was like, wow, I did yeah. not anticipate this level of she rallied, depravity. She, she did. Rallied. She did. She did a great job. All right, um, but uh, she also did a great job after we signed off on Friday. The Florida grand jury came forward with its initial findings. Now, this is just an initial report. They make it very clear this thing is going, this, go, this goes on. There will be more witnesses called, more subpoenas issued, more reports issued. But this is just its preliminary report. And I got to tell you, brother, if this is the preliminary report, it packs a wallop. Next hour, we are gonna. She put together an awesome Twitter thread, breaking it down, going through the entire report. We're just gonna plagiarize her work while giving her credit for it, and we're gonna walk through her Twitter thread, breaking down the biggest news items of the initial Florida grand jury investigative report on COVID stand. That is coming up next hour. You don't want to miss it. But until then, here's Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by traitors of the highest order. Let's take a step back for a moment and look at our situation on the southern border. Illegal aliens from all over the planet have poured over the southern border at record numbers for three going on four years. Some estimates place the number of illegals entering our country between 8 and 12 million since Joe Biden took over. To put that into perspective, there are only 78 entire countries out of over 234 total with a larger population than the number of illegals who have entered ours in the past few years. The United States, as a supposedly sovereign nation, has the moral obligation, right, and power already to enforce its border and expel illegals immediately, but has not for reasons. So naturally, we need a piece of legislation to tell us what we can and cannot do at the border. That's where Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema and Oklahoma Senator James Lankford come in. Last night, the text of their supposed bipartisan border Israel and Ukraine funding bill came out. And it's even worse than what was touted a couple of weeks ago when Joe Biden and others promoted it. That bill includes three times as much money for Ukraine as it does for our southern border. It codifies into law that nearly two million illegals should be let in every single year. And the bill says if Joe Biden feels like it, he can let more in. It contains a provision that allows the Department of Homeland Security to grant illegals immediate employment eligibility. The bill explicitly states that any disputes about the legality of the bill will be settled in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the same court that's dealing with Trump's J6 case, in case you're wondering about that court's legitimacy. The bill removes what little existing funding there was for a border wall and pushes the deadline for completion to 2028. Oh, and did I mention this bill contains three times as much funding for Ukraine as it does for the border? $60 billion for Ukraine when last year's Marine Corps budget was around $54 billion. This bill and its sponsors, Kristen Sinema and James Langford, is and are traitorous crocs of poop. House Speaker Mike Johnson says the bill is dead on arrival in his chamber if it even passes the Senate. In other news, the U.S. hit dozens of targets in Iraq and Syria over the weekend, which killed an estimated 40 people. The strikes were a retaliation against Iran for their proxy groups, killing three U.S. soldiers in Jordan last week. For reasons only Allah knows, the U.S. gave Iran a heads up these strikes were coming over the weekend. In El Salvador, President Nayib Bukele won his re-election bid for president in landslide fashion, apparently cracking down hard on gang and crime makes you pretty popular. Donald Trump's D.C. trial over his actions leading up to J6 has now officially been delayed as appeals courts try to determine the extent to which Trump enjoyed presidential immunity. The trial had been slated to begin in the middle of next month. Alberta, Canada is banning chemical castrations and meatball surgeries for minors in the name of gender. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith says she believes children and youth shouldn't be able to make such life-altering decisions at a young age. And finally, airing tonight, 8, 7 central on a and RFK Jr. Snake Wrangler. For those of you listening, what we're watching is a video of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. catching a rattlesnake with his bare hands. And that's what happened while we were away. I don't care who you're voting for, man. That's pretty badass. I mean, I, that's... That's more impressive than Bill Clinton playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall, and that one might have won him the presidency of the United States. <laughs>
It's 30 years ago. Uh, Aaron's Montage brought to you by friends over at Birch Gold. Elections in Taiwan, North Korea on the brink. Iran increasing its aggression. Uh, There's a lot of global instability as we ourselves plunge into yet another election year where things will be manipulated for everybody's narratives. You know how it goes. That's why you need to know. It's not too late to diversify an old IRA or 401k into gold, and Birch Gold Group can help you with that. As opposed to many other investments, gold thrives in times of uncertainty and is an important part of diversifying your savings. Here's how Birch Gold can help make a, make it a part of yours. Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax sheltered IRA in gold, and it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket either. Just text Steve to 989-898 for a free info kit. That's text Steve to 989-898 to Birch Gold with an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, thousands of happy customers. I encourage you to arm yourself with the knowledge of the diversification of your portfolio through precious metals. Text Steve to 989-898. Claim your free info kit today. Text Steve to 989-898. All right. Um, I, I want to talk exclusively here about this immigration deal. And Aaron, thank you very much for highlighting. Uh, I mean, the low lights. Yes. There's a plethora of poison pills in within this. Um, to me. Well, it's kind of funny that everything there were leaks about this. A few days ago, as Aaron, I think you also pointed out your montage, there were leaks about this a few days ago. And uh, Senators uh, Langford and Sinema and their people uh, vehemently denied these links. Wait till you see the bill. Well, last night they gave us the bill. And in some places, it's actually even worse than the leaks. Now, I think the worst provision of them all. The worst provision of them all, in my view. And, and it's one that also demonstrates what the schema of this bill is. Because what they're going to tell you on many places like Fox News, I, I even saw they send out their outstanding border reporter, uh, Bill... Um, Malugin. Malugin, thank you. They sent Bill Malugin out. Clearly the edict came from corporate. Uh, he's out, he was out there defending this bill last night. It's an indefensible bill. But there, there's, the, there's four big takeaways about this that I think you need to understand so that you can be a smarter, more empowered citizen. Number one, the worst provision in the entire bill, and, it's, and, and the, this provision is the thing by which you catch the conscience of the king. This is, this is how you know, you know, when, when the other side sends out its apologist, I'm sure National Review will have uh, how caste systems and uh, permanent indentured servitude for corporatists is really a conservative immigration solution. I'm, I'm sure that's coming. All right. The checks have been written. I'm sure that's all coming. OK, but here's how, you know, here's how you know the intent of this. Like I couldn't figure out during the Gang of Eight back in the day what in the world Marco Rubio was doing. Going to blow his entire, he was the clear front runner for the 2016 Republican presidential nomination. And, and probably if he never does the Gang of Eight, I know Ted Cruz doesn't run. I don't think Donald Trump runs. Rubio is the unquestioned front runner. Heck, he committed a cardinal sin of, 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 of recent politics by becoming the face of that and still ran a competitive presidential campaign after the fact. Imagine how it would have been if he had never done that, right? Until one day he called me on the phone and tried to and tried to win me over to this piece of legislation Marco Rubio did because he wants to run for president. And where do I live, Todd? Iowa. Iowa. That's why he called me on the phone one day. And and I I asked him it was a, it was a respectful conversation, but I asked him about several parts of the bill I didn't understand on the merits. Right. So what, what's the real, you know, in politics, there's the right reason we do things. And then there's the real reason we do things. OK, so the, none of the right reasons, the math, none of it added up. None of it did. So I'm missing something. What is it? And he told me what it was. I, it was not an answer I anticipated. I mean, I basically anticipated the Well, you know, our corporatist overlords and we're all whores up here. They want the cheap labor. So that's why we're doing this. 
that still could be the the real reason or one of them. But he said to me, he said, Steve, I don't even know if this will work. But if we don't do this mass amnesty right now, the Hispanic vote for the next generation is going to be what the black vote was for the last generation. And we won't get, we barely get 30, 30, 35% of it now. We won't get 10 or 15% of it later. The Democrats will win uh, in 2016 and then they will legitimize all of these people. And we've just created another permanent electoral minority against us. Translation. We have to go full Esau. We have to sell our birthright, our legacy, our border. And then he even admitted to me, I don't even know that it will work. I don't even know if I don't. He even told me, I don't even know that this would help me if I'm the nominee with Hispanic voters. But if we just look ahead next 20, 30, 50 years, and I'm like, Marco, if we do what you all want to do to the border, we won't have another 20, 30, 40, 50 years, brother, to look ahead to. So what is this really about? The circuit court provision tells you what it's about. The circuit court provision is the thermal exhaust port of this Death Star. It's the most important piece of news. And there's a lot of there's 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 way more Aaron could have done his montage on guys that that could have been a 10 minute montage. I mean, this is literally a dissertation on 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 treason. I don't know how else to put it. I don't want to be overly bombastic, but this is a form of treason, guys. But here's how you know, here's how you know what the real intent of this is. That this specific bill, now, you know, they tell us a lot of times, we have to do whatever the courts say. They are the all-powerful courts, right? That Congress really has no jurisdiction over the courts. I mean, the courts are supreme. They're the supreme being, right? Okay. Except, you know, when they want to remember how the process actually works. This piece of legislation, like like with Obamacare, do you want to know why Obamacare had to be challenged in the courts on subsidiary issues like the mandate or the definition of state exchange? And it could not be head on tackled because they limited judicial review seven times in the original Obamacare legislation. That's why. Because they can, can they could have done that all along. There was nothing stopping Republicans when they had control of Congress from just outlawing all abortion in Washington and having George W. Bush sign it and say... And there will be no judicial review of this legislation. They could have done that. Could have absolutely done that. Case in point, this legislation redirects judicial review to a specific circuit. And as Aaron told you, not just any circuit, the absolute. Now, how many good circuits do you think we guys, what are there? I think there's, is it 13 or 16? I can't remember the number, but how many good circuits do you think we have? Answer, not many. Fair. Okay. Imagine in our current judicial climate, being absolute the worst, most vile, most villainous, most Marxist, most totalitarian star chamber of a circuit we have in today's judicial climate. And that, that is the circuit court that they redirected judicial review of this legislation through. So that anything you go after that you need clarification or interpretation on the same courts. You know, I, I read last night about a couple trying to time with, with, with young children trying to time when one of them gets out of jail from J- for January 6th so that the other one can go in, how they're going to run their farm and take care of their small children. It's that circuit court, that one. That one. Maybe the worst circuit court in American history. That one. They wanted to make sure in this bill that judicial review of this treasonous piece of legislation was went through the filter of the most un-American circuit court that we have. The worst of the worst. And they're and guys, that's already a low bar. We're, that's essentially like who's the least sleazy porn star? I, I, what drug addict has the fewest, you know, the fewest strawberry hills on his arm? That's what we're saying. And they made a point of saying 
That's where you have to challenge this legislation or have it reviewed through that court. That is the thing that tells you right there, despite their talking points, whatever their counterpoints are, whatever, whatever the Fox News, uh, you know, directive that went down that had Bill McGoolin going on Twitter last night, making a fool of himself, whatever it was. That tells you what this is really about. That's the real reason. This is about making sure they have total control over that situation. Period. Point two. How bad is this legislation? This legislation is so bad. Mike, I'll fund anything the Democrats throw at me. Johnson won't even take it up. Mike Johnson's T level registered 0.1, like the COVID IFR. How bad does it have to be when Mike Johnson, who will fund anything the Democrats give him, anything Mitch McConnell gives him, and then tell us it's about a biblical worldview, guys? How bad does this legislation have to be when not even Mike Johnson will bring it to the floor? That's an endorsement. Point three. The Senate seat that may decide control this year is in Arizona. That could very well be the 51st U.S. Senate seat come November the 5th. Carrie Lake has almost no money. Now, she's probably going to win that nomination just because she has the support of Donald Trump alone. But this is a race that it's probably going to cost over $200 million to win. And when I say that, that's the combined cost that every, both sides. Well, in this case, there's three sides. Because remember, Kirsten Cinema is technically an independent. So the Democrats will have their own nominee. So this is going to be a three-sided race. $200 million minimum, I believe, will pour into this race. The most expensive Senate race in 2022, I think, was Pennsylvania. It was over $300 million was poured into that state for that seat. That's right, over $300 million for a race with a guy who was promoting tranny surgeries on television before any of us ever knew what they were. And another guy who was, at the time, a walking... Vaccine adverse event reporting system incident. <laughs> what a country. Anyway, I digress. What was the issue that took Godfather from political novice and novelty act to force of nature? Do you guys remember what issue it was? The border. Yeah, it was. Do you remember where it was he did his first mass rally talking about the issue? Was it Arizona? It was in Arizona. Yeah. This is on the T. I mean, this, this, this is a hanging curve. I, I just can't even imagine. All right. This is. I, I can't even imagine you can't at least hit this one into the gap. Let alone like in the ninth row of bleachers. The entire Carrie Lake Senate campaign should just be about this legislation. If she's a border, she wants to represent a border state. Who's one of the co-authors of this piece of legislation? The woman holding the Senate seat she's running for. It's a, it's a top two, three issue, no matter where you look in any internal survey. If, there's a, if, if, at, if, if at any point in this race, there is a commercial or any speech from Kerry Lake about anything... Other than this board, fire everyone. No one gets to do this ever again. This ought to just be a 275-day referendum on this piece of legislation. Period. This has tons of crossover appeal. There is plenty of populist anger and angst about this. And it's, we've got a proof of concept of what? Riding the wave 
the wave of this issue can do in national politics. And it's her wing of the party. It wouldn't exist without this issue. We wouldn't have a president ever have had President Trump without this issue. I'm not even sure he would have made it to the Iowa caucuses without this issue, let alone won the nomination. So she's in a very divisive situation right now. Just got booed at her state convention. Did they set up this guy with this tape? Why'd they wait so long? I, I don't care about any of that. That's why we didn't talk about any of it. That's all inside baseball stuff. And if you listen to the tape, she tries to loop Ron DeSantis into it for some odd reason. I mean, I don't even think the whole thing was just, I don't think, any, I don't think anything about that entire story was genuine, frankly, uh, by anybody. That's terrible people doing terrible things to other people terribly. But this could be the 51st seat that determines who gets to who who decides who replaces Clarence Thomas in the Supreme Court or not. Does that have any value for pretty much anybody within the sound of my voice, do you think? Should. At least a little bit. We can debate how much value it has, but it certainly is not nothing, right? Right. Certainly not nothing. Well, here it is. And if you can't exploit this, if you can't win with this, at the end, I don't want to hear, they didn't do this. Ron DeSantis sent some email to somebody four years ago. No, 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 no. If you can't win with this, that is a you problem. I mean, this is political manna from heaven. You can't ask for a gift like this politically. There is TARP level pushback to this legislation as we speak. And you're running against the woman who's authoring it? Come on, man. That's your whole campaign. Let's get going. Meters running. Here we go. Point four. Democrats cannot win a single county in Oklahoma presidential elections. Did you know that? They can't win a single county. The senator who co-authored this with Kirsten Cinema, what state is he from? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Seventeenth Amendment sucks, man. I'm sure we all voted Ray Lankford to save America, right? This legislation is treasonous, and I think previous eras of this country that gave us this country would have we have would have put people on trial for treason for legislation like this. And I look forward to that making the Media Matters weekly uh, roundup here in their newsletter come Friday. But it's true, nevertheless. This is treasonous. And it's co-authored by a Republican from a state where Democrats can't win a single county. A single county. Meanwhile, Kirsten Cinema, she's like the most non-crazy Democrat in the Senate. And she'll put her name on this in an election year when it could hurt her after she's technically an independent. So the independent Democrats will do treasonous legislation. And they, and they do it with the help of the reddest state Republicans like Lankford. But here's the thing. A lot of people complaining about this now. <laughs> oh, yeah. It can get worse. A lot of the same comp uh, people com rightfully complaining about this now. If Fox News decides in 2028... That Mr. Langford is your GOP nominee and puts its thumb on the scale for BoomerCon. That has more than one meaning. A lot of those exact same people will be clamoring that are the complaining the loudest now will be complain will be clamoring louder, even louder later. We have to vote Langford to save America. And that, folks, is why you're in the generational hole you're in and likely aren't going to be able to dig yourself out of. Can I get an amen? Yes. You're going to be really disappointed? Absolutely. The RFK Jr. video that I played at the end of the montage, it was actually reversed. He's releasing a snake, not catching it. You can't have nice things. Oh, no. We suck again. <laughs> Thank you.
Back here on the Steve Day Show, you know, past this past December, drug shortages hit a record high. And this risks causing severe disruptions in medical treatments. There can be delays, treatment cancellations. I mean, if this continues, you could even see a situation where doctors are now prioritizing which of their patients to give prescriptions to. And we're talking about things even as important as venerable antibiotics like amoxicillin. That's why you want to get a hold of our friends over at Jace Medical. Take control of your situation with the Jace case. And yes, you can include ivermectin in the Jace case as well. Uh, But this is a customizable case to back up your medications or if you want to do this for a loved one you, you've got a parent a grandparent maybe they're uh, on assisted living and you want to look after them you want to make sure they have the meds that they need you can do this for them as well uh, just to make sure you have the peace of mind to know that you're in control of your situation not a, a public health system Uh, That next hour, you're going to be even more angered at and disappointed by after we walk you through some of the preliminary findings of the Florida grand jury uh, that were released on uh, or released last Friday uh, in its investigation into COVID. So take control of your personal health situation with the Jace case. Go to jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E, that's how they spell it, J-A-S-E for jacemedical.com. Use my last name, Dace, as your promo code while you're there for a discount. Promo code Dace for a discount at jacemedical.com. That's Jace Medical, J-A-S-E, jacemedical.com. Joined now by a a longtime buddy of mine. Uh, He is an absolute pro-life warrior, film producer as well. He's got a new movie coming out here next month. We'll ask him about that uh, a little bit later on, too. But uh, good to see you again, Jason Jones. How are you, brother? Great to see you, Steve Dace. So I know you're a world traveler as well, man. Where have you been since the last time you and I talked? Well, I've I've been all over the Middle East. Uh, We're working since the collapse of Afghanistan most of my organization's time and effort has been spent sheltering, uh, uh, evacuating and resettling our former Afghan allies who were abandoned by uh, the Biden administration during their disastrous withdrawal. But I've, you know, I've been to Iowa. I was just in Iowa talking about you. And uh, what I said was, in a speech that I was giving, is that something will, that will never be in the history books, the role that Steve Dace and Iowa played in uh, convincing the RNC that they will never have success trying to pass uh, a lukewarm, faux pro-life candidate off on the Republican Party, and really Iowa being first in the nation and having Steve Dace and his radio show sort of standing there guarding uh, the way the Republicans. <laughs> you shall not pass! Yes. Yeah, there's Steve Dace yeah. and uh, all the folks from Iowa. So I just want to thank you, Steve. Uh, you know, for you played a big role in um, overturning, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And uh, the people of Iowa played a big role. So I'm, I'm glad I get to be on your show. And thank you for that. Thank you, man. I mean, that, coming from you, given uh, your commitment to this cause and all the work you've done for it, that means a lot. I appreciate it. And I know you wrote about this over at the stream uh, just a couple of weeks ago in accordance with the with the annual March for Life. And, you know, since you brought up, you know, lukewarm candidates on the issue, let, let's start there. Okay. Because because. What I, what I have been fascinated by uh, is, it, it, you know, the great frustration that for those of us who were strateg- strategists on the Cruz campaign in 2016, trying to defeat Donald Trump, the, the great frustration we had is that he took the most right wing based position on every single issue. All right. Even though, I mean, this guy's friends are, you know, used to be people like Al Sharpton. He took the most right wing based position on every issue. And it was to his advantage because he didn't have an electoral record. You know, he couldn't, he, he, Mitt Romney had a record. Mitt Romney tried to do this too, okay? But he had a record as governor of Massachusetts that said the exact opposite, right? And so since right. Trump did not have a record, and we didn't have much of a record either, our candidate was only in his first term as a senator, and he was in the minority, trying to create that issue contrast, given the power of his presentation on top of it, was the greatest singular challenge we had, okay? Because we had nothing to go back to our, we were going for the same voters, and we had nothing to really go back to those voters and say, hey, this isn't who he really is, right? Okay? And he said things like, you know, I'm, he didn't say, I'm, I'm going to appoint strict constructionist judges. He said, I'm going to, he sat on a stage with Hillary Clinton in front of 100 million people and said, I'm going to appoint justices that will overturn Roe versus Wade. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he, he took the most right wing base positions, even in the general he did. All right. And what's fascinating is watching the way that he has campaigned in this election. 
I, I think that we actually in 2016 could have beaten this version of Donald Trump because this is, you know, without the benefit of if he had run like this in 2016 without the benefit of incumbency now is what I mean. And he has a good pro-life record as president. But the stuff he's saying now, you know, well, I don't really want to take much of a position. You know, we got to win a general election. Um, you know, heartbeat bills are bad. Um, you know, we can come up with a compromise that everybody will like. Is it 18 weeks? Is it 20 weeks where it's okay to kill a kid? You know, we'll, we'll figure something out. Um, and, and I'm curious, because if it wasn't for his record, because you can't ignore it, that's who you really are, but his rhetoric is very Romney and McCain-esque vis-a-vis his record as president is how much of this do you think jason is electoral strategy to think that he can find some way to to not anger in you know single women to come out and vote against him in droves in the fall despite the fact he's the guy that overturned roe um how much of it is that he thinks the party's moved too far to the right on the issue and he's going to use his force of will to bend it back what do you think well i think it's it's strategy and it's strategy that's being spoon-fed trump by quote unquote, pro-life leaders who have lost confidence because of minor setbacks. After the overturning of Roe versus Wade, when you take a hill, you should expect that artillery is going to fall on your head after you take that hill. Mm -hmm. So what, what, you know, um, in the wake of the overturning of Roe versus Wade, which can you imagine, we live in post-Roe America, um, to imagine that a movement that was organized around the federal level uh, we have very professional national pro-life organizations, and a lot of the state organizations, God bless them, they're well-meaning. They're made up of hardworking people that have day jobs. They're, uh, they're, you know, they're still in the 70s and early 80s. So we have a lot of work to do in professionalizing our local and state pro-life organizations. So this was just all to be expected. But what you said about the rhetoric doesn't sound sincere, and how sincere he sounded um, when he first ran for president, and how frustrating that was for us, Steve. He invited me to meet him at the Palm. President Trump did. Uh, Mr. Trump, prior to, you know, this was not like 2012, uh, to possibly join his team if he were to run for president. And I shook his hand at the Palm 2 and I said, Mr. Trump, I actually came here to tell you that you will never be the Republican nominee and that you will never win because you're not pro-life. And he said, well, I have people who tell me that I can win if I'm not running as a pro-life candidate. And I'm like, I'm here to tell you that you won't win. In fact, Steve, I said, and we will, t- we will take you out in Iowa. I will be waiting for you in Iowa. I didn't, I didn't say Steve Dace will be waiting with me, but I knew Steve Dace would be there with me. And so I felt he was very insincere. Then as somebody who was this close, I was this close to being an ever-Trumper, but there's people I trusted like Elvita King and Father Frank Pavone who told me of their long relationship with Trump, and this is who he really was. Then I went and looked back at his interviews, even from the late 90s. Whenever he was asked about abortion, he would go like this, I hate this subject. He would shake his head. He seemed repulsed by the subject. I realized... Uh, that um, President Trump really had some sort of unique, deep-seated revulsion to the uh, to abortion, where he maybe had a proper understanding of the abortion issue. Uh, and then once he uh, came to office, I found working with his administration easier than with any administration that I have ever worked with in an over 30 years of the pro-life movement. And he had a lot of very pro-life personnel. So I think what we're seeing now is not Trump's sentiment but strategists and what they don't understand. And the reason I wrote this article is that I feel like the Democrats have hoodwinked us. This is like they threw a grenade in our own tent to create um, confusion. Mm. The Democrats don't want to run on the abortion issue. Look at movies like Nefarious or my movie, Bella. They they, the pro-life movies generate massive ground uh, swell support and are very successful. You can look at movies like, I don't know, uh, Cider House Rules or the one I don't even remember. Uh, that just came out that was a total catastrophe that was pushing this abortion view. What you cannot measure, what polls cannot measure, Stephen, what, what you know, is that the energy and the get out the vote effort for the Republican Party is all from committed pro-lifers, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. And, and so what the Democrats are effectively doing is they don't want to run on abortion, but they want to create division in the ranks of the GOP. They want Trump to backtrack to unsettle his own previous position, uh, to deflate energy from our get out the vote effort. And the get out the vote effort is very important. So the reason I wrote this article is, look, and we as a pro-life movement, um, we need not nitpick and constantly change uh, the end zone. We need to, you know, the goalpost needs to be the goalpost. And I think what we need to be very clear about this time is where didn't we have success last time? Well, at the international level. Uh, we need a personnel is policy. 
We need a pro-life. We need a backdoor meeting at Mar Lago where we're promised a pro-life uh, ahead of the Office of Personnel and Management. We need a pro-life um, ambassador to the United Nations. I have friends that work for Nikki Haley because I live most of my life in Hawaii. I'm in Hawaii most of the time. Um, they would call me at three in the morning, New York time, where they were engaged in some battle, and they would be in tears because Nikki Haley behind the scenes was undermining Trump's own position, undermining our pro-life commitment. We need to see the, 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 the Department of Justice's war on uh, conservative churches and the pro-life movement and the infiltration of the Catholic Church. Uh, this all needs to come to an end. Uh, we need him to be very clear that he's pro-life. But we're, we're sort of picking the pro-life movement has all these different pet initiatives. Um, and I don't think Trump should be lured into, a, you know, to advocate for one segment of the pro-life movement's um, pet legislation or mm -hmm. pet goals. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be a very clear commitment to life a pro-life vice president, what a devastating, if, if the VP is, is not pro-life, we lose. We lose. By the way, that article um, at the stream is titled, We Shall Go On to the End of the Long March for Life, We Shall Never Surrender, if you want to read it at stream.org. Stream.org is where you can read that. I want to make sure we address this point, too, because you raised it, and it's something I've tried to explain to this audience, is that the, the, the ecosystem of the right, we ideologically talk about decentralizing power, but the ecosystem is very centralized. If you look at the Republican Party, the National Party has all the power. State parties have very little of it. You see the same thing in the conservative organizations. The national big direct, fundra direct fundraising groups, um, they have all the power. The local chapters have almost none. Uh, it's the opposite on the left, where they centralize power, but, they have, but, po po but politically they're very decentralized. Their state parties have a lot of power. Their local state organizations have have a lot of power. The national DNC is is basically just a fossil, and and so what? Now that we're in this new era post row, the you know it, I, we're still kind of behind the Maginot line here of you know fighting this like everything has to be a national piece of legislation. When they were ready, they were ready for the next battlefront. They attacked us in Michigan, then Ohio, back to back. They were ready to go on a state level. I mean, I had the head of Michigan Right to Life call me uh, three months before that vote two years ago, Jason, begging me to help him raise some money because they were getting no help nationally at all. And, and, and I think this is something that a lot of people in our audience don't understand. And that's one of the reasons why they, they're pushing this Lindsey Graham bill that we don't frankly have the political clout right now to pass, even, if, even though I'm in favor of it. But why? Because if we keep the issue national, they stay in control of the issue. If we, de if we, give, if we empower these state organizations, these people that we see on Fox News all the time, they're out of a job. And I think people don't understand that's a lot of what's going on here right now and why we're getting our ass kicked, frankly. Yeah, no, Steve, when I was a young man, uh, after my high school girlfriend, while I was in basic training, her father beat her up, forced her to have an abortion. Uh, I was a 17-year-old private in the Army, and I said, I'm going to spend my life to protecting the child and the woman from the violence of abortion. After my time in the military, I went to the University of Hawaii, and then eventually became the director of Hawaii Right to Life around the time I finished grad school. I knew I had to move to Washington, D.C., I knew I had to move to Washington, D.C. if I wanted to, to um, have any utility towards the pro-life cause. And to make movies, I had to move to Hollywood. And so I worked in D.C. and Hollywood. You know, how, if I were a young person today, um, there's nothing better than to stay where your family and your friends and your roots are. How great it would be if I was a young person today, um, instead of 30 years ago, I would stay put. I would, I would serve and build out my local party. I would serve and build out the local pro-life movement. And instead of trying to make major Hollywood movies, I'd have a podcast and I'd be trying to influence through social media. So this is a different world we're in. And so for those young people watching, um, you know, the battle is really right where you are. We would say that 30 years ago, but then you'd realize there's really not much we can do. But now the hard work we need professional pro-life organizations at the local and state level that are well-funded, the battle at the, at, the, at the local party level to, to you know, start by at your precinct and work your way up and make sure that you have a pro-life um, a pro-life local party, a county party at the state level, um, join the platform committee. These are the important places to be. And you're right. We saw what those pro-life initiatives in the states actually um, from from distant powers, from the quote unquote right, the pro-life initiatives were being undermined. And so we really need to learn how to how to push back. 
All right, we've got about 90 seconds here. I want to make sure we mention Cabrini. That comes out in March. Give us a preview of the movie. You're one of the producers, and how can people no, go I'm and not, see it? I'm not, oh, I'm I thought you were. Producers, my actually. bad. Okay. My, uh, my partners who I've made films like Bella with are the producers, and I've been hosting screeners for inf- influencers. I, I wish I could say it was. It's one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen. Glenn Beck recently, my friend sent me all these quotes, compared it to um, the Godfather, I always compare it to Titanic in its sort of scope, beauty, and grandeur. Wow. Uh, Alejandro Monteverdi, who's one of my dear friends and business partners, is the director. And I'm glad the world is going to see who I've always known him to be, I think, the best director of our generation. But it's about a little Italian nun. It's a classic American story. What I love about Alejandro, all of his movies, Bella celebrates an immigrant family in the United States. Little Boy, which looks at the internment of Japanese through the eyes of someone who loves America, and now this, the struggle of the Italian immigrant experience in the late 19th and early 20th century, which was quite a struggle. And they had faced a lot of prejudice, but the director adores this country as an immigrant where all his dreams came true in this country. So it's a look at this nun who was sent here to serve Italian immigrants who are struggling. Um, Mother Cabrini went on to build more schools and hospitals than the Carnegie's and the Rockefeller's than anyone hmm. ever. And uh, so it's a powerful film. Um, and you know every you know everyone i i've been telling people it's the most beautiful movie i've ever seen and they're like hmm okay jason it's your friend i think this is a bit hyperbole and then and they see it so i cannot wait it opens on three thousand screens wow in on, on i believe three thousand screens around three thousand screens from angel it comes out on, on, on national women's day march 8th make sure you go see it um it's it's going to rock the world and it really shows the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to thank you again, because you're, I remember getting the galley copy of your book, Nefarious, and it went on to be one of the most powerful films I've ever seen. And I still get people who don't know I know you sending me texts a couple <laughs> times a week that I need to go see this film. And you know better than anyone the power of the word and the power of beauty and art uh, uh, to, to push back on this great reset. You know, we're going to use truth, beauty, and kindness and goodness um, and we will triumph. Amen. I got 30 seconds, brother. How can, and thank you again. You're too kind. How can people follow your work if they want to? Well, my organization, the Vulnerable People Project, we seek to serve the most vulnerable community, communities in the world facing ethnic cleansing and genocide working in Nigeria, all across Africa. Go to thegreatcampaign.org and join in the great campaign to promote a culture of life, a civil, civilization of love. Good to see you, brother. God bless. Take care. You got it. TheGreatCampaign.org is where you want to go. And where you want to go is right back here next. The Florida Grand Jury's initial report is out, and it's a whopper. Back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Alongside Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. Let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. Steve at stevedace.com, D-E-A-C-E. You can also like us on Facebook, MeWe and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And then if you are a podcast listener, please, if you have yet to do this, leave us a five-star review. Heck, even if you have, try doing it again. We need all the five-star reviews we can get. Thanks to all of you that have left us at least one or maybe some. Uh, also, hit subscribe, or if you are a iTunes offic- an iTunes aficionado, a hit to follow. That way, every single time we do a new episode, it will show up in your feed every single time. This part of the show brought to you by our friends at Magic Spoon. If you want to hit your New Year's goals, like more protein, less sugar, but you want to bring back and not lose your love of cereals. Magic Spoon has reinvented your favorite childhood cereals to great taste, each serving, though. Zero grams of sugar, up to 14 grams of protein, five or less grams of net carbs per serving. It's wholesome, it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, soy-free, and that doesn't mean taste-free. Tried uh, the peanut butter variation when they came on board. I was blown away. 
by how good it was. And it's just 140 calories a serving. Uh, there's, there's plenty of other options, too. Uh, I mentioned the peanut butter one. How about maple waffle, honey nut, chocolate chip cookie, and more? You can also get their treats, the perfect on-the-go snack. Uh, they're just like the marshmallow treats you loved as a kid with only one gram of sugar, two or less grams of net carbs. You can't beat it. Packed with 11 grams of protein per bar. Those come in both marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. So, this is why you want to head to magicspoon.com slash dace. Magicspoon.com slash dace. Grab a custom bundle of cereal. Try the magic for yourself. And don't forget to add those delicious treats for the on the go. Uh, use the code promo code dace at checkout to save $5 off your order. Promo code dace at checkout for $5 off at magicspoon.com slash dace. Magicspoon.com slash dace. Well, folks... Um, this is a day we have been waiting a year for, and, and really a day we've been waiting several years for, but officially we've been waiting a little bit more than a year for this day. And that is for somebody, anybody with an official letterhead that can provide within our government some form of transparency and accountability for what was done to this country and our way of life beginning March 16th, 2020, where we went through a period not knowing we'd ever get our way of life back. And the ramifications of those decisions are still being felt today, whether it's, I mean, really, you could take, you could take every issue. We, we talked about the border. Why are Democrats in power to open the border and allow a replacement invasion? Well, because via the COVID lockdowns, they had the means, motive, and opportunity, also via the CARES Act that Trump signed, where he gave them $400 million to initiate the very kind of ballot harvesting scheme they've been trying to install most of our lifetimes, and we've stopped them from doing it, and they, all, and they got to deploy it all in one fell swoop and use that to win the last election, which gave them the power to do what they're doing to the border right now. Correct. See, there there is not an issue. There just isn't. But foreign policy, man, we might we might be looking at war with Iran. Iran was a doormat when Donald Trump was president. He had them isolated. He had divorced Iran from pretty much the rest of the Muslim world. The Saudis were talking to Israel more than Iran, guys. Okay. Well, the people in power now calling the shots, including on foreign policy, that have led to a reascendant Iran, where'd they get the power from? Everything I just talked about a minute ago. There is, there is nothing. Everything else that we have right now either has its origins or its amplifications based in what happened beginning March 16, 2020. Everything. Everything. You can't find me something that either isn't because of March 16, 2020, or March 16, 2020 didn't make a lot worse. The ramifications for those decisions are still being felt. And on Friday, finally, the grand jury commissioned by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, came forward with a report of its initial findings. Before we go over some of the specifics that have been itemized by our good friend Tracy Beans over at UncoverDC.com, we're just going to take her work, show it to you, and comment on it ourselves. Do either one of you have any introductory or preamble remarks to kind of set the tone of what we are about to discuss that yes. this group uncovered. Yes. Go ahead. And, and I'm sorry, this will be covered <clears throat> in one of, the, uh, one of the items that Tracy itemized. I think everything you need to know, and I think the biggest news out of this interim report, I think this tells you everything you need to know. Federal actors, agencies involved, relevant actors within the federal government are refusing to cooperate with this grand jury. I was going to say the exact same thing. That's the biggest thing you need to know. 
Tell me, tell me you're, tell me you're guilty without telling me you're guilty. That's where you're going to go to. Trust the experts. Even if they tell you we don't have to show up and screw you. I know people died, but we don't owe you nothing. Trust them, though. Let's begin. And, and let's start with, with its introductory statement. And I, I just want to read a, uh, a portion of this. As of today, I'm quoting now from the grand jury report, quote, as of today, our investigation is nowhere near complete. We remain in regular session and our legal advisor is actively scheduling future witness appearances. There are still many months and much more testimony and evidence to come before our work will be finished. Thoughts on that? Well, it's related to what we already got talked about. It's right out of the gate. That's an entire indictment of the expert class. Remember, we have Fauci on tape in 2019 talking about winking and nodding. Now we almost think of it as about the laborious process of getting vaccines passed. And it's going to take some kind of special circumstance Wink, wink. Dude, for, telling Mark Zuckerberg on yeah, a Zoom call yeah. in the summer of 2020, yeah. hey, we can't rush these things. And he talks about leaky vaccines. I mean, he was still saying this even in the at the height of lockdowns and the pandemic itself. He was still issuing these warnings. Right. So, you know, it's it's amazing if this is really about public health, as we learned, every, everything, stop what you're doing. Everything must change. How we do everything. Yet here, th- there's no excuse for this taking more than a year. And it's not the fault of anybody in Florida. Everybody else doesn't want to get to the bottom of this. Aaron, should we set Todd off? Yes, um, we should. Of course, of course we gonna should. It's going to be this whole hour. Yes. And so let's let's... Let's go ahead, man. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. All right, let's set you off, Todd. Over, under, right now. More states join Tennessee and Virginia in suing the NIL, suing the NCAA over NIL for college football than join uh, Florida in convening their own grand juries to see. You get me. <laughs> there it is. Force. Yes. Wonder Twin that Powers know the activate. Answer. So yes. cringy, man. We know the answer to that. <laughs> It's true. That's not even a question. Like, I don't think any other state will do this, including our own. And, and there's already, Virginia's already signed on with Tennessee, right? With that, uh, that, uh, that uh, action against uh, yeah, the there's one other, Yeah, there's one other state, I believe. Yeah, so so, so I, think, I think that's already one more than will join Florida here. And, that, and you could, because Steve is good at that, good, good at this, you could just say, oh, that's an interesting, clever abstraction you did, Steve. To, no, he's talking about the, these, these things are linked. They're not, it, that's not some extraction Steve did. They are willing and able to get away with what they do because they understand a fundamental that Steve just laid out for you, a psychological and emotional fundamental about how we worship, what we worship, how we love comfort. Uh, that S- Steve would honestly could just do a treatise on what he just said, and you know damn well I will. I think it's also... I know there was a lot of hope for those of us that wanted DeSantis to be president, that this was going to come out earlier. In hindsight, I think it is better that he is not in the race. While this initial report came out, because it would have given the system is the system is largely ignoring this. I mean, people like us and and, and at, at platforms like the blaze you know, alternative media is covering this. No legacy corporate media is covering this at all. None of them are. It's a total blackout. And and yet the same thing would have happened if Ron were still in the presidential race. But then they could have they could have justified what they were doing, in my view, as well, you know, this is just all, you know, political gamesmanship. He's running for president, doesn't really care about the issue. And we're not going to help the guy advance his own, you know, campaign. That's not our job. By him not being a candidate right now, and now this grand jury comes, report comes out, 
it's a little bit like what's the old uh, the classic uh, line from Alexander Solzhenitsyn? Um, we know they're lying. Hmm. They know we know they're lying. We know that they know that we know they're lying. Yet they keep lying anyway. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because now that that fl- false objection, that 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 fig leaf of, ah, oh, this is just him, just you know, drumming up this issue for his own political ambitions. Now that that canard is off the table. You are left with no other, no other reason to justify why you would ignore this, right? Agree or disagree? Yeah. yeah, of course. And so the 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 fact that they do want to d- d- to ignore it, just and the fact they don't want to go and testify, tells you all that. Just like what Aaron said too a minute ago, that does tell you all you need to know. And with him not being a candidate currently there's no excuse now everyone's without excuse we all know why they're ignoring this we all know why and and that's also why more states will sign on to sue the NCAA over what to pay college athletes than will sign on with Florida because if they really thought there was a political ambition here to be achieved they would do it but but you're going to be rewarded we're not victims. The people are never the victims in a free society. Never, never, never. The people are never, all bold, all caps, never victims in a free society, especially in armed people are never victims in a free society. You will always get the tyranny you deserve that you will consent to. That's what government by the consent of the governed means. You get the government you deserve or you'll consent to. So the villains here aren't the people that won't go and testify. Well, let me phrase that. The only villains here aren't the people that won't go and testify. Their collaborators, or in this case, co-conspirators, are the, are the, is the lack of the will of the people to demand it be so. The lack of the will of the people to go to their own red state governors and say, where's our grand jury at? Why aren't we subpoenaing these people? It wasn't that just one state did a heartbeat bill that caused the overturning of Roe, but like six of them did. A critical mass was built. Same thing is required here. And that's not happening. And I don't think it will happen. And I don't I don't think and I think it's because there really truly is no political, at least not right now. Yeah, I here's what I think is funny. Actually, it won't be funny if it happens, because it'll we'll be screwed. But Funny, you know, I guess in a sardonic, all we have left at the end of the age is to chuckle way, okay? If Trump loses here in 275 whatever days, you're going to see a lot of people that right now have seemingly no interest and think there's no political ambition to be achieved by pursuing this. Next year at this time, there's going to be all kinds of people that are going to be interested in what the Florida grand jury thinks. There's going to be all kinds of people that are going to be wanting to pursue this because what we have right now is each side's political idolatries and partisanship is in the way of getting to the truth, both sides. Because Donald Trump is just, is, is just on a human level, not capable of the level of deprecation or empathy that it takes to say, hey man, we panicked, we didn't do everything right, and I should have fired these guys, and that's why I'm coming in hot when I come back. That's all he'd have to say. And he'd only have to say it like one time. And everybody'd be like, oh, okay, the air has been let out of the balloon. Let's go get these sons of bitches. That's what would happen, right? Yeah. But he won't say extent, it. He, yeah. But he won't say it. Nope. Nope. And so because he won't say it, the idolatry is in place on our side, too. We're not allowed to talk about this right now. Can't bring it up. Right, you're getting in the way of the election, Steve. You've got to win the election. I, I saw a Hollywood actor who a year ago was tweeting, no amnesty on COVID is now out there tweeting, we have to give amnesty to Trump and vote for Trump. I mean, this is political idolatry. All right? And so that gets in the way, of, the partisanship angle gets in the way of absolutely everything. We know the other side doesn't want to have any reckoning because, I mean, their hands are all over the murder weapon. I mean, this, you know. Trump was their useful idiot for much of this. I mean, this is this was their plot. This was their nefarious plot. I mean, they just used him, you know, like uh, like the useful idiot that he was from beginning on March 16, 2020, a kept man. So it'll be interesting. If there's anything if there's anything positive that comes out of blowing an election, we frankly cannot afford to lose. It would be it will be at this time next year. There's going to be a lot more people on our side interested in a reckoning over this stuff than are willing to talk about it right now, in my view. Amen. Yeah, that's true. That's, so let's get to it. 
we're going to take these highlights one by one and comment on them. All right, let's begin. Uh, again, thank Tracy Beans at Uncovered DC for doing this work for us. Hey, man, I read the eight hours of depositional testimony from Anthony Fauci last January and put out my thoughts. I, I did my tour of duty. So, Tracy, it's your turn. All right. right. Federal officials and agencies refuse to testify. It can't be compelled. Further, the report acknowledges inflated numbers of COVID due to cash incentives benefiting hospitals. These are the coding, meaning if you coded something as COVID, you got more of a cash incentive uh, from uh, from uh, from the government. These were the kinds of things in 2020 that we posited, discussed. Told you. And they they were they were all conspiracy theories and not true. And. That's absolutely the first piece of evidence here in the Florida grand jury initial report. Not only, not only us, the three guys in a room, the guy, do you remember, the guy who invented the PCR tests actually stepped forward and said, um, they're, they're using, I it remember, wrong. they're I, using it wrong. Yes, I, I remember when the New York times did, was it the New York times? I think it did that story about how the PCR test and the sensitivity levels Ratchet, and they're way, way out of whack. High, yeah. and, and, and I was citing that story. I was getting fact checked by, you know, fact-checking organizations for quoting the New York Times story exactly what it said. And I'm like, I, I didn't write this story. Why? So, so, so the left-wing fact-checkers didn't want to dare fact-check the New York Times, so they fact-checked people like me for quoting and citing the New York Times. That's how crazy that stuff was back in those days, man. That, in a way, doesn't it seem like that was like 10 years ago? It doesn't. It still doesn't seem real in many respects. It doesn't seem real in many respects. I mean, the, the local sports bros, the virtue signaling that was demanded. They're they're up. They're talking about the the. Uh, yeah, I know it was hard because early on you had to get the the invasive swab all the way up your nasal cavity, and they're getting on and recounting. You know, yeah, it was a little uncomfortable. We got to do it for each other. I mean, this was these were all crisis actors, you know, and, and this test. That clearly was bought. I mean, it was used and abused and bought and paid for. I mean, you've already mentioned we don't need to go any further. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have how many more bullet points? This was a scam Uh all along. Well, let's go to point two. The grand jury acknowledges that the death numbers were inflated because of and these were the conversations we had at the time as well. Who is dying with COVID? Who is dying from COVID? One of the lines from the grand jury report, uh, quote, uh, this figure is very likely inflated to some extent with people who died with rather than of COVID-19 disease in order to financially benefit whatever hospital the person died in. The CARES Act, and my goodness, this is one of the worst pieces of legislation of all time, man, this thing is. This thing is a friggin' hydra with tentacles that just, uh, uh, cancerous tentacles that just metastasize tumors, everything it touches. Will it touch this too? The CARES Act provided a, quote, death benefit, unquote, for up to $9,000 to the families who died from COVID-19 disease. So again, every incentive here was to inflate the numbers, to inflate the statistics. Remember we said at the time, in any other era, people like us would have had to encourage folks to take something like this more seriously. This was the first, the first pandemic of, of all time where people demanded this thing be worse and more serious than it actually was. We had those conversations a lot mm-hmm. a few years ago, gentlemen. And yep. she'll address, and, and, and the grand jury addresses just how dangerous, dangerous it actually was in a few more tweets. Yes, we will get to that. All and, right. And you'll remember this all happened. The very, I was pretty emotionally on tilt because my dad had just died. And I was begging you like it's the death numbers that they're showing and this was even uh, this was even before Steve's deep dive on the IFR but like it's it's not going to be that and what this tells you really they knew it too because if it was as bad as they thought they don't have to do this they knew it wasn't as bad as they thought which is why they have to fake the numbers like this and they were doing it early they knew yeah, my wife Bella was ahead of the curve of of any of the three of us. I, she's I saw a nurse these, for people yeah, that don't remember. Nurse. We haven't talked about that. In she a while, was doing yeah. med surge actually at that time, so kind of a generalist. 
And I asked her when I started seeing stories of this disease spreading through China, she had already kind of done a little bit of research and she had just surmised through what she saw. It was kind of a glorified cold or flu. What did it end up being? A glorified, what does glorified make something bigger? Mm -hmm. Glorified cold or flu. Remember when they told us we couldn't call it that? And then when Debbie Burks gave her presentation yeah. on what it would take to <laughs> reopen the country, the flu. they called it, uh, uh, what was it? Influen- IFI, yeah. in- or ILI, influenza-like illness. Okay. And so they told us for months or for weeks, we couldn't call it that. And we were uh, killing grandma. And then when Debbie Burks came out with her plan of how you'll reopen the country, they categorized it as influenza-like illness. Mm-hmm. That's what they called it. Yes. In the next point, Tracy points out again, uh, the $9,000 for family death benefits, if it was from COVID-19, 1.17 million people are said to have died from COVID. And a lot of people stand to gain from those death benefits, folks. I mean, death is its own industry. All right, here we go. You guys mentioned it. Let's get to it. What was the actual infection fatality rate for covid All right. Uh, This grand jury, through testimony, got to as accurate of a number as they possibly could. Now, when you're making public policy, when when you go to see a doctor. All right. You want to know that doctor's case fatality rate. Like if you're going to go see an oncologist for a cancer treatment, you want to you want to know that cancer clinic, that oncologist, you want to know their case fatality rate. Just strictly you're dividing the number of cases of like illness and then what the fate, how many of those people died, because you want to know how good they are at treating this. OK, because you're you're at a you're looking for a very specific treatment to a very specific disease from a very specific entity. But when we're dealing with mass populations of people and we're talking about aerosolized viruses that can also manifest asymptomatically, we need a broader definition than that. And that's what an infection fatality rate is. Okay, so here's the infection fatality rate for COVID-19, according to the Florida Grand Jury. All right. Um, for those five years and younger, and younger, 0.002%. Now they want, of course, to they wanted to make sure to jab the children, the babies. Uh, for those 15 and younger, uh, 0.006%. We had to uh, close all the schools and keep those kids home, maybe on Zoom school forever. For those 25 and younger, uh, 0.029%. You could not work, uh, stay home, save lives, don't go anywhere. Um, for those 35 and younger, uh, 0.105%, just to folks, that means that if you were 35 and younger, it was over, it was almost 99.9% odds that you were going to survive COVID-19. Okay. 45 and, and, and younger, uh, uh, 0.0286%, 55 point zero six two four percent we're still in the 99th percentile folks and we're into people in their mid 50s that's pretty much your workforce right there we shut everything down right that's pretty much the 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 majority of your workforce right there Uh, retirees 65 percent i'm sorry age 65 1.706 percent so now we're into the elderly and we're still over 98 percent survival rates in the elderly, we're at 98% survival, survival rates, 75 uh, years old, uh, 4.84%. Now you get into, okay, now we're getting into targeted people who maybe should have been maybe looked after, isolated, okay? And then 85 uh, and older was 12.972%. But here's the thing, guys. The, the, the average lifespan in America is just under 79 years old. The average age of those who died of COVID, do you guys remember what it was? I'm, see, I'm remembering all these stats that we had at the time. It was, it was, it was 79 span. years old. Yeah. Like exactly the lifespan. Exactly the lifespan. This is why I said, again, in March, in April 2020, you'll recall I said it as many times as I could. If we had to choose a pandemic... We would have chosen this one because it didn't come like a thief 
in the night for our children. It just didn't. And we knew that all along. But, I mean, my goodness, even with polio, that did come after children. What people still don't understand, this is why going through data like this and shoving it down your throat is so important because most people have no understanding that most people, including children, who got the polio virus, and by most people, I'm, you know, 95% of people just have symptoms of the common cold. But nobody knows anything about this anymore, including doctors, because of the payoff scheme that Steve already just got done talking about, and we might get into more late. There's so much money behind this. Even even the so-called experts have no knowledge of that with polio. They'll just shoot you up. Yeah, I. so the, the grand jury looks like they settled on kind of a median yeah, it's IFR 0. of 0.27, 0. 0. 0. Yeah. which means 2.7 people per 1,000. That's incredible. And I just remember, especially I, I think April of 2020, we were getting ready to go into a long weekend, but we had to do like this emergency video because uh, Stanford, yeah. Stanford had completed its serology test, finding I think the number was right around somewhere around there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. They had done their first. And I just remember spending the first part of April and the mid part of April and then just the rest of spring, why aren't we doing serology tests? Why aren't we doing any of that? We didn't the want answer, to know. Yes, the answer to that question is because this was never about the virus. Nope. It never was. These people are, are evil. Yes, the Fauci's, the, the coronavirus task force of the world. They are evil, but they're not stupid. They knew the way to see how far this is spread. They knew the way to, to see a, a, an actual IFR, which would then inform policy. They knew the way to do that was testing uh, for, to, to see how many people had actually had this disease in a population. They knew all of that, but they didn't want to because this was never about COVID. It was never about this virus. It was about a whole heck of a lot of other, other things. And little did we know back in April that a mere maybe 45 days later, it would be proven once and for all this was never about COVID. When we had marches arm in arm for the death of St. George Floyd, man, getting a little bit of whatever version of PTSD this is, because it was so obvious what this was. And they just did it right out in the open nakedly. And we just shrugged. That was that was basically the posture of the vast majority hmm. of this country. Just what can you do? Well, we didn't do anything, apparently. And there's more to come as well. We'll continue looking at the initial revelations from the Florida grand jury when we come back here on The Blaze. Stay tuned. If you are in the market for a hearing aid and uh, maybe that market has freaked you out because they are in the thousands of dollars in many cases. That's why you want to talk to our friends over at MD Hearing. If you're still paying or you're like, I can't pay thousands of dollars for hearing aids that may not even work right. MD Hearing uh, is an FDA registered rechargeable hearing aid that costs a fraction of what typical hearing aids cost. In fact, their brand new XS model costs over 90 percent less than clinic hearing aids. And the XS is MD Hearing's smallest hearing aid ever, fits inside your ear. No one's even going to know that it's there. MD Hearing, how do they do this? Well, they were founded by an ear, nose, and throat surgeon who saw how many of his patients needed hearing aids but could not afford them. So he made it his mission to develop a quality hearing aid that anyone can afford. So if you want MD Hearing's smallest hearing aid ever, uh, you can go to shopmdhearing.com. Shop mdhearing.com use the promo code steve to get their new 397 dollars when you buy a pair offer you can't beat it that's 90 percent less than clinical hearing aids all right again shop hearing shop mdhearing.com shop mdhearing.com and use the promo code steve at shop mdhearing.com all right let's continue on our good friend uh, tracy beans over at uncovered dc 
she was kind enough to go through the Florida grand jury's initial findings on COVID and uh, take out what she thought was the most interesting. All right, we left off with the IFR table. And again, just to, to, to summarize this, before we, before we uh, stratify uh, for age or comorbidity, the median IFR for COVID was 0.27%. 0.27%. Now, again, some of you are going to say, well, we didn't know that at the time. Yeah, we did. In fact, if you go and read John Ioannidis from Stanford University, his original white paper, what was that? Uh, the, was it the Diamond? Um, Diamond Cruise. That's right. The Diamond Cruise ship that was left in the port where we had the, uh, the first true study of, uh, of coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 spread. That white paper and what the actual numbers ended up being, I mean, I guess I kind of think, you know, told us you trust know what? the... I'm going to we'll look that up right now. You go trust... You, they tell you to trust the experts. I mean, John, John Anitas is the head of population health. He's the leading epidemiologist at Stanford University. It's a top five med school. None of us could get into Stanford. I'm guessing most of this audience probably couldn't. You know why? Because most Americans can't. So... And Aaron brought up the, the seroprevalence study, the serology study that Stanford did in April of Santa Clara County, had similar results. We could have been doing this all along. Remember that the government only published one set of antibody studies that I can remember. And they were published around the Friday. That's right. I'm remembering all this stuff now. The Friday before July 4th weekend, and they were done in like April and May. And remember, as we were getting ready to roll out the vaccines, and I was screaming on the air at the time, why aren't we doing updated antibody studies? Why are we giving vaccines to people who have antibodies? That's not, that's not a vaccine program. We don't do that. I mean, if this is such a, 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 an immediate emergency, then, you know, you give the vaccines to the people who need them. If you've got antibodies, you don't need a vaccine. What are we doing? Remember these conversations? Oh, yeah. They're all coming back to me now. I'm, I'm, I'm like that line in, in the first Avengers movie. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Banner, I think it's time to get angry. I'm always angry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's talk about comorbidities. And you know why all that stuff, you had to ask those questions, and the obvious couldn't be, it could just instantly mm-hmm. push it down? Because a whole country named Sweden could be pushed into non-existence. Correct. That's why. Correct. Yeah. So this is from March 17th of 2020. This is at Stat News from Dr. John Ioannidis. Now, he's talking about case fatality rate, but um, which is different than infection fatality and, and, rate. And it, but it will he does, always be yes. higher. Yes. If we assume that the case fatality rate among individuals infected by SARS-CoV-2 is 0.3% in the general population, a mid-range guess for my Diamond Princess analysis. So 0.3, that's, he's kind of inferring, he's transferring over a case fatality rate from that Diamond Princess cruise to a general population, and he guessed that that would be 0.3%. That would be the CFR? CFR. Which, if you do and the I think math, he's kind of transposing that into yep. a general pop, gen pop yep. analysis, so that's pretty close. That's pretty close. That is absolutely pretty close. I mean, wow. Um, hold on. I just had a brainstorm. I'm looking something up. Hold on a second. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find. You guys remember the piece Fauci wrote for the oh, New yeah. England Journal of Medicine? <laughs> yeah. Guessing what he thought uh, it would be. Um, here it is. I just found it. I just got. I just found it. March twenty sixth. Now these things are published after they're written. Okay, so that he wrote this well before this. But March twenty sixth, two thousand twenty. Navigating the uncharted. This is uh, Anthony Fauci co-writing with Robert Redfield. All right, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, um, talking about COVID uh, nineteen. Um, all right, let me find where the number is. Okay. Oh, uh, gosh. Forgive me, guys. We're doing this live on the air. I'm hey, doing Todd, this by memory. Um, Here, I'll, I'll talk to Todd while you figure that out. Todd, why do Norwegian naval ships have barcodes on the back of them? I don't know. So that when they go to port, they can Scandinavian. 
gosh. All right, I found it. And, and the audience is like, did, thank you. You didn't find it soon enough. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm sorry about that. All right, quote, these are the words of Anthony Fauci writing in the New England Journal of Medicine, March 26, 2020. On the basis of a case definition requiring diagnosis of pneumonia, the currently reported case fatality rate is approximately 2%. Um, Another article here in the journal reports a mortality of 1.4% among 1,999 patients with laboratory-confirmed COVID-19. These patients had a wide spectrum of disease severity. If one assumes that the number of asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic cases is several times as high as the number of reported cases. So in all actuality, if Johnny Anides, for example, is, is forecasting a CFR of 0.3, his IFR would be somewhere around, if you do the math, would be somewhere around maybe even a little bit lower what the Florida grand jury is estimating because there's so many more asymptomatic cases. That's what Fauci is saying here, particularly when you're dealing with respiratory viruses. Okay. The case fatality rate may be consistently less than 1%. This suggests that the overall clinical consequences of COVID-19 may ultimately be more akin to those of a severe seasonal influenza or a pandemic influenza like we saw in 1957 and 1968, rather than a disease similar to SARS or MERS. So who is comparing who is comparing COVID-19 to the flu? Breitbart, Steve Dace, Donald Trump, Anthony Fauci in, in the New March England Journal of Medicine of on March 26th, 2020. 2020. Those are his exact words. I just read them to you. That's something I I had this memorized for because I mean, how yeah. many times did we cite this back yeah. in those days? I mean, I we cited this all the time and I had completely forgotten about it until now. Which, and this is the kind of stuff in our book. This is how chapter, Fauci what bargain. changed? Yes. What changed? That's right. That's a main tenet of the book. What changed from, you, you figure there's at least a 30 day lag when you write something for a monthly publication like this for it to get published. So you assume he wrote this in late February. Okay. Uh, so what changed in the time that he would have had to submit this by deadline to be published in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine to what was it March 11th? I think was the date that he went or March 12th is right. when he went to Congress and basically yeah. said, it's the end of the world. Yes. What changed in those two and a half weeks? What changed? We never got the answer. My, oh, we got the answer. Yeah. Uh, we well, did. Our, it's called redacted. Let's get on a phone call with a bunch of uh, pathologists all around the world, virologists all around the world and discuss how we might have actually unleashed this thing. That's yeah. What, see, that's my theory is exactly what you just said. Is he found out, oh, we made this thing. And since we made it, we don't know what it is. Could be anything. It's a it's a complete chimeric concoction trying to make a vaccine. I think that's what it was. Absolutely. I think you're right. All right, let's continue on. Uh, Tracy notes that attempts by proponents of lockdowns uh, oh yeah, I mentioned comorbidities. I f- didn't finish that point. I'm sorry. Comorbidities didn't matter. Age did. So all this talk, if you've got an autoimmune disease, you know, like our own Glenn Beck, you know, at the time made the right decision, self-isolated for what was like 30 days that Glenn did the show, his part of the show, right? In his own studio, I want to say it was back in those days. And hey, we didn't know this at the time. Okay. But what we know now, comorbidities weren't the issue. Basically, like any other flu bug, pneumonia bug, age was the number one and really driving comorbidity of of COVID-19. All right, next. Attempts by proponents of lockdowns, school closures, etc., to quote, memory hole COVID decisions, stating they didn't have scientific data are futile. Data was available. It was ignored and attacked. It wasn't an information problem. It was a judgment problem. In other words, it wasn't that they couldn't know. They didn't want to know. Going back, as you just alluded to, Todd, the memory holing of Sweden, for example. The country that just did literally after we were told for 25 years, it was the one beacon example that what that, that the Democrats fever dream of remaking America would actually work. Suddenly, when we need in Sweden, when we needed to actually pay attention to Sweden, yeah. they were nowhere to be found. And this is also why the the grift, the monetary buy off and the anticipation of uh, the jab was so important. That because the longer this went away, the more people just flat out knew, 
about, I mean, we've seen how people, doctors uh, who've been on the show many times, our friend from Wisconsin, why can't I remember? Uh, is, uh, Ron Johnson? No, a doctor from, uh, he's been on the show multiple times. He's not. Oh, you're talking about Pierre, Pierre Corey. Corey. Yeah. But like, he's like, the more people knew like ivermectin works and things like that to suppress it, to say, no, you're going to lose your medical license. You're going to be arrested if you do this. The, the, to memory hold that, the financial incentives within that industry were in were so this is important. A, this is just truly demonic stuff, yes. man. This truly demonic stuff. All right, let's talk about lockdowns next. Lockdowns were acknowledged not to have a net benefit and be implausible in stopping the spread. Remember, uh, the, do I, did I skip ahead on you, Aaron? No, I skipped ahead accidentally. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Lockdowns were acknowledged not to have a net benefit and be implausible in stopping the spread. Remember, we had the studies from China that showed that they didn't stop the spread at all. They just actually, that's how you just got the virus now at home. Okay. Because it's, it's aerosolized. You can't stop it, guys. People have to breathe, okay? So, you, so okay, I'm not getting it at a bar. What the Chinese found was, okay, I'm just getting it from Grandpa. All right, I'm getting it anyway because it's in the air. We can't stop it, guys. And we shut down okay? colleges and sent them home to yes. Grandma. Yes, yeah, like exactly. This. this is why, like I said, yes. both related to the jab but now and related to this. How many times did I say it? Had we done absolutely nothing, we'd be better off than Every interaction we did, every at, at, single one. At the one. very least, everybody that didn't get a cancer screening in time to have a treatable form of cancer would agree with you on that. Yeah, because that was elective, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and quote, in short, they were useless lockdowns were in stopping the spread and in small targeted areas may have postponed spread or flattened the curve. The result, though, would always be the same infection. It's just how long it would have taken. Lockdowns didn't work, and, but they hmm. did kill. And this is again. Sweden, uh, as it so happened, based on the, the demographics and the timing of this all, they did have the dry timber effect. Their uh, uh, mortality the year before COVID was actually uh, pretty low. So there were just more old people uh, uh, living at the time that were probably going to die mm-hmm. one year, two year, three years from now. That's, so they, they did get hard, hit hard early on. But on every graph we have now in the Western world, right. in the world at large, they're at the bottom of it in terms of excess mortality. Correct. The Florida grand jury goes on to deconstruct, and it refers to them as studies, <laughs> loosely the cdc used to inflate and manufacture the efficacy of masks in several examples my favorite example do you remember the one the cdc did with the crash test dummies <laughs> do, do you remember this the, no. they used they used dummies to show yeah. masks work okay because that's that's <laughs> that's human behavior okay that that's that's humans humans you know move and and turn and contour and breathe and talk okay that can be simulated by a dummy um you couldn't make some of this stuff up and yet they did it anyway and they did and they did um A preprint posted, this is the next uh, tweet that that Tracy puts up there. Uh, A preprint uh, posted in July of 2023 concluded after reviewing 77 studies on the issue of masking that, quote, uh, these publications pertaining to masks drew positive conclusions about mask effectiveness over 75% of the time, despite only 30% testing masks and less than 15% having statistically significant results. How you get to 75%. By the way, that number is, is, is even way lower than they were telling us they worked 100% of the time. Okay. The level of evidence, I love this final line here, quote, the level of evidence generated was low and the conclusions drawn were most often unsupported by the data. Let me repeat that. The level of evidence generated was low and the conclusions drawn were most often unsupported by the data. Do you guys remember when when Senator Cruz allowed me to write and submit questions for his yes. office to send to yes. Robert Redfield, who was the, the Surgeon General, I believe, at yes, the time. Because he, before or no, he wasn't the CDC. Surgeon General. Yeah. CDC, he was the head of CDC. You sent him Surgeon them, General was that it, nut yeah. job Jerome Adams. He was Trump's CDC, uh, yeah. or Surgeon General. He's a, he's a nutcase. <clears throat> Pardon me, but I, I ghost wrote some questions, <clears throat> excuse me, for Senator Cruz's office 
they cleaned him up a bit and sent him over to uh, Robert Redfield uh, to get answers. And one of them was, can you point us to any randomly controlled studies that show masks work? And, and can you point us to any randomly controlled studies prior to June of 2020, I think is what I had in there, that showed mask work? Because otherwise, mm-hmm. why weren't we wearing masks all every cold flu pneumonia season our whole lives? Why aren't we wearing masks if they worked all these years, right? And one of the things that he sent back in his footnotes, again, these are things I'm remembering now, was a study from Goldman Sachs. Do you guys remember this? And it, and it found that it might stop like, oh, you, yeah. you, had to, you had to mask something like 5,000 oh, yeah. people For to like stop two one, infections like, yeah, yeah. or some crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. number. Yeah. And then I thought, wow, that's, inc- that's crazy. But then when Norway did their mask study later in the year, they found virtually the same thing. And that's why they didn't. They didn't do masks because they found that they found they this had to is- mask up like 4,000 people to stop one infection. It's just not it's just not realistic. Look at all this fake energy. Just, this ties so well into how you started off the show about the border. We didn't need these studies. We already knew. We don't need new border legislation. We already have what we need. Just enforce it's just the law. That nobody yeah. wants to do the thing that must be done. Correct. We're not a nation of laws, but political real brother. All right, we're going to stick around and finish this thread on the Florida Grand Jury Report for our subscribers at blazetv.com. For the rest of you, we will see you tomorrow. Until then, Romans 828.